Another interesting aspect of predator-prey relationships is this the interplay of the amount of energy that you expend to find food and the return that you get. You know, you can expend a lot of energy and get a, an energy-rich food. Or you can expend a little energy and get a type of food that doesn't have that much energy. If you think about herbivores, how easy it is. You're just going along and eating grass or eating leaves. <clears throat> it doesn't take very much energy. You don't have to chase down a prey. You just have to wander around or move around and then and graze. The trade-off is that you don't get that much energy from what you're eating. There's a lot of energy that's wasted because you can't digest it. Whereas if you're like this lion chasing down an antelope, it takes a lot of energy to hunt that animal and catch it. But if you're successful, then you get a lot of energy. Your digestive system is very good at absorbing that energy, using that energy. So the return on your investment is, is pretty good in terms of the energy that you obtain. So there's this whole idea of the way that organisms, predators, have evolved in order to maximize the amount of energy that they get based on the amount of energy that they expend. And that's the idea behind this optimal foraging theory, that the amount of energy that it takes to access a prey, obtain a prey, is going to maximize the uh, amount of energy return. Maximum energy intake or for your investment of energy that you're maximizing the amount of energy that you're obtaining. So if you looked at the amount of energy spent versus the amount of energy obtained, then it would be optimal, that it would be at, at the peak. So we'll look at this first with an example, a couple of examples, and then we'll, we'll look at a curve that illustrates this, what I'm talking about. So this is the idea behind it, that uh, there's a genetic basis. If you're successful in finding food, you reproduce more. Whatever tactics you used, whatever behaviors you used, resulted in you obtaining more energy, that there's a genetic basis for those behaviors. And that those traits are going to be passed on to your offspring and those traits are going to be more and more common in the population. So there's going to be selection for these. So, for instance, there's a blue jay that's foraging for uh, peanuts and it behaves a certain way. It forages and collects peanuts or whatever its prey is in a certain way, obtains a certain amount of energy that goes towards reproduction. That behavior is becoming more and more common, has a genetic basis, and it's selected for and the alleles that are associated with that trait become more and more common in the population. So that there's a genetic basis, an evolutionary basis for these optimal foraging behaviors. If you're a turtle and you forage a certain way for seagrass or jellyfish, whatever it is you're eating, that you're going to optimize your energy return based on your investment. So this is the figure that I was talking about before, that you're spending a certain amount of time, or it could be effort as well, energy, basically, you're expending a certain amount of energy, whether that's time wandering around or whether that's running really fast or swimming really fast after a prey. And the amount of energy that you obtain as a result of that energy investment is going to be maximized. So that red line is, is, uh, indicates the maximum return of energy for your investment of energy. That's optimal foraging theory. It's not just time. Time takes energy. But it could be uh, chasing down a prey, something like that, handling a prey, that where that line intersects that curve, that is going to be the amount of time that something will spend on collecting P 
peanuts instead of some other kind of prey or that uh, a turtle will spend in this place as opposed to that place and so when it when you've exceeded that and you're not obtaining as much energy as you could someplace else it's time to move on or if you're not obtaining the maximum amount of energy from from uh, this certain type of plant or certain type of flower, you would move on to a different type. You'd choose a different type. So this is talking about patches. There's a certain amount of energy in this patch of blueberries, and you move on to another blueberry bush. Or there's a certain amount of pollen in these flowers, and there's still more, but it's not worth your time to stay there. It's You're going to receive more energy per unit time or per, per unit energy investment if you fly off to some other patch of flowers. And so animals, they're not sitting there thinking that, okay, it's time for me to move. But those behaviors are selected for. And you have a bear that spends a certain amount of time on this blueberry bush. There's still blueberries there, but it moves on to the next bush where there's a lot higher density of blueberries. Those kind of applications. And so... If you let's look at this uh, example of goals, seagulls or goals, they're just goals, and what they're getting in response for their effort. So you've got a goal flying around looking for different things to eat. Well, they're looking at these different zones, zone A and B and C that have different types of prey in them. Along the rocky shore of this beach, you find urchins, you find chitons, and you find mussels, three different things that gulls eat. And they have different densities. In zone A, there's a lot of mussels. In zone B, there's not very many mussels, but there's more chitons. In zone C, there's a lot more urchins and not so many of these other things three different areas where these goals could feed. And so if you followed a goal in these different areas and you saw how much time they're spending in these different areas, you'd see that they do search for different amounts of time in these three different zones that have three different types of prey. It takes a certain amount of effort to get energy from these prey. So if you look at the handling time that's required to feed on an urchin, you have to catch that urchin, you have to break it apart, you have to feed on it. That's a considerable amount of handling time that it takes eight minutes to handle an urchin. Whereas a mussel, you get a mussel, you crack it open, you can do that in three minutes. Chitons take a little longer, but it's roughly the same. And then in terms of the amount of energy, the amount of energy that you receive from eating an urchin versus a chitin versus a mussel. Now, there's a lot of energy in an urchin. There's way more energy that in, in a chitin than there is in an urchin. And there's the fewest amount of energy. There's the least amount of energy in a mussel. So, each type of prey is abundant to different degrees and uh, in each one of the zones. Each type of prey requires a different amount of time and each type of prey results in uh, different amounts of energy being available for the goal. So if you combine all those different factors, then the energy gain per hour is really high for chitons. So you would expect the gulls to feed primarily on chitons. However, if you look at these different zones, in zone B and C, there's a relatively high density of chitons. So in those two areas, you might expect them to feed on chitons, preferentially over urchins and mussels. In zone a, there's hardly any chitons. There's a lot of mussels. And so if you look at the amount of energy that you're getting from mussels in zone A, 
then of course that's what you're going to eat there. But the best return for energy expended in terms of gain in energy for these goals would be to feed on chitons in zone B. So if you followed these goals around and saw what they were doing, then that's what you might find is that they spend most of their time of these three different zones in zone B. And they spend most of their time of these three different prey types feeding on chitons. That's what the, the kind of thing that the optimal foraging theory would predict. Now there's d debates about how well this actually works and, and how well it's actually expressed in nature, but sometimes it's demonstrated fairly well. Other times it doesn't seem to make sense. But that's the idea behind this optimal foraging theory. So this idea of predator-prey relationships, there are a lot of very interesting predator-prey relationships. There's predators and there's prey. And we're very interested in this very spectacular demonstrations of predator and prey. Some of them not so pleasant. We don't like to see some hawk that's killed a bird on your on the porch in your your uh, bench in your backyard. Here on campus there used to be this little population of bob white, these quail that would uh, they lived in a courtyard <clears throat> And people, these secretaries, liked seeing them outside the window. But every once in a while, a hawk would come down and eat one of these, these quail. And they would always complain about it and not like the hawks. But it was not nature. It was a biology department, so it was very fitting. But right outside the window, it's an otter and a fish and an eagle and bear eating fish. And then there's uh, this fish that ate a duck, snake, it's eating a fish that some fisherman caught, sharks, a rabbits, bears, fish, birds, a little fish, there is a, an alligator with a deer, osprey. Now there's a predator that's being chased by a predator, a fox and a, an eagle. We looked at cooperative hunting. Now there's a buffalo and some wolves. And another fox that's involved in these predatory relationships. The fox is trying to get away. Not big enough. There's a bird and a seal and a shark all feeding on. There's a killer whale launching itself up on the beach to try and... A lot of very interesting predator-prey relationships. It goes on all the time. There's a mountain lion. There's a mountain lion jumping onto something. Killer whale and a shark. Some predators and predators. Bears. We looked at these uh, at the beginning, not thinking of it as predation so much, but there's herbivores or predators in a way on plants. That thing's trying not to be, get eaten, running down the street.
dead penguin doesn't even look like it's alive. Well, you get the idea. There's uh, some fantastic, very interesting predator-prey relationships out there. So that concludes this short, uh, the last part of predator-prey relationships. And now we're ready to move on to symbiosis. It's another major type of interactions that take place amongst species. So that is what we're going to look at this week the week of March 23rd.